words from me. Um, so uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, many of you I know have been here before. So those of you who are new, welcome, and we hope we will see you again uh, to History Matters and coffee really does. Um, we're going to be talking about the postal system today um, because, uh, and I'll come back to this in a moment, but tomorrow the Postmaster General is going to be testifying, and although this initially I was, I was, had a number of things I thought about discussing for this week, but then uh, had some consultation with Matt as well. Um, the, the idea really was that before, if you're forever who's going to watch that testimony, it would be helpful to have a real understanding of what the postal system is, what it does, what it was intended to do, the powers that it has before you listen to that testimony. So that's kind of what I want to delve into today. But before I delve, I turn things over to my partner in crime, Matt. Uh, who will explain the proceedings this morning. Welcome everybody. We have a nice group today. Um, so uh, our rules are as they always are, which is um, please use the chat uh, to have conversations and uh, talk to one another and all that good stuff, but please keep it germane to what we are talking about and of course family friendly. If you do have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A. That's where we're going to be taking the Q&A questions here in a few minutes after Joanne gets done talking. Um, and as always, if you enjoy our programming here at the National Council for History Education, please make sure to visit us at www.nche.net and become a member or just use our website or visit us on social media. Uh, and we uh, like to stay in contact with our folks. So we would love to see you and love to see you at other, other uh, um, excuse me, other events. We have some great stuff coming up in September. And so if you can get on, get our newsletter, that's going to have all, uh, which is called History Matters. Um, you can get on there and we will uh, make sure to get you links and dates and all that kind of good stuff. And by the way, I should say, uh, Joanne's, an episode of this History Matters and so does Coffee is, will be featured this, this month. So, wow. Um, so. History Matters with History Matters. Yes. So, um, so with that, I'm going to hide away and we will, I'll come back uh, for questions a little bit later. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, again, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, as I said at the outset, um, here we go, let me shift myself here. Uh, come on, computer, what are you doing? There we go. Okay, as I said at the outset, um, we're going to be talking about the postal system, the post office today. Obviously, <laughs> it's an understatement to say that it's in the news. Um, but what's striking about it is, and in a sense, my starting point is, it's not normally in the news, right? That, that there are many, many aspects of um, the workings, the mechanics of democracy, of a democratic government that we totally take for granted, that are fundamental, that are there, that are um, networks in one way or another that connect the nation, but that we just don't think about because they function, right? We're thinking about it now uh, like, when was the last time you thought about a blue mailbox on your corner, right? I can't say I think about that very often, and now we're all thinking about them because we've seen images of blue mailboxes being carted away from wherever they began. So um, now that they're being taken away, suddenly we're alert to the fact that they matter, their presence is there, right? That, that it's something that, that matters. And so suddenly we're grappling with this. This is kind of the moment that we're in in a lot of ways um, is that as um, fundamentals are uh, challenged uh, or overturned or, or as norms in one way or another are violated, we're, we're often being shaken uh, with the realization that, wait a minute, that was there and it matters a lot. So this is one in a series of those kinds of, of realizations. Um, but, and this is the larger point that I'm going to make today, uh, and it's a point that's been made in the media um, because of the obvious link of the postal system uh, and, and the mail with mail-in ballots and the coming election, but even beyond ballots, the fact of the matter is that the postal system is a basic functioning aspect of any kind of democratic governance. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here, a little bit of the history of that and what people thought about the mail and how the postal system was put into place and what the thoughts were behind it at the time and really the power of it, what it does. Now, um, one of the things that, that people notice right off the bat 
Uh, there were aspects of it, even at a really early point, but particularly by the time you get to like the um, 1830s and on, there were aspects of the postal system in the United States that Europeans saw as being distinctive. And one of those was the fact that was its reach, the fact that it was national, the fact that even if you lived, for example, in the Michigan territory, which I'm about to come back to, even if you were out in some remote territory, you still could get mail delivery. Um, and uh, I mentioned that because Tocqueville, let me find a quote here. Tocqueville, meandering around in the United States in 1831, came to the United States uh, from France, thought to himself, well, what I'm going to see, among other things, is I'm going to go along the eastern seaboard, I'm going to see civilization and technology and things that I might assume would be there and that aren't necessarily that distinctive from Europe, but the further west I go, the less of that I'll see, and in a sense, the more primitive American society will become. So he's traveling through, uh, across a lot of territory into what at the time would have been known as the Michigan Territory. And this is what he reflects. There is an astonishing circulation of letters and newspapers among these savage woods. I do not think that in the most enlightened rural districts of France, there is intellectual movement either so rapid or on such a scale as in this wilderness. And he goes on and talks about how, you know, the people who are out here are actually um, people just like on the Eastern Seaboard who happen to move to someplace rural, right? So he's, he's kind of amazed at the way that the male not only reaches that territory, but is having an impact on pulling those people into the larger nation. And that's, you know, from the very early point, from the earliest point, and we've also seen a lot of discussion of this recently in the media, um, the idea that, you know, the Constitution, the mail is actually in the Constitution and it gives, um, the Constitution gives Congress the power to establish post offices and post roads. Um, so it's there, but it's really in 1792 with the, the Post Office Act of 1792 that that's really given some oomph and put into play. So it's put in the Constitution, it's recognized that it's important, but the full implications of that begin to be really discussed once the Constitution kicks in, beginning in 1789, and by 1792, they actually pass an act about it. Um, the, the act does a number of significant things. Um, it, for one thing, gives newspapers favorable terms in the mails, right? The assumption is, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, that newspapers are going to spread information in a crucial kind of a way. And by spreading newspapers, they will be spreading that information Newspapers are assumed to be tools of accountability for the government, keeping the government accountable. I'm going to come back to that too. So spreading newspapers, getting newspapers out among the American people is important. The Post Office Act of 1792 also says that government officials cannot use the post office as a surveillance technique. They can't use it to get at people's mail, which is highly interesting in and of itself. And then finally, that Post Office Act sets up procedures to facilitate the expansion of the postal system, to get that network moving, which of course so much of the legislation in early America is concerned with. It's like, okay, well, this is good. Now what happens? We're probably gonna expand somehow. We don't know how, what if we do and how will things continue to work? So that's the, the terms under which things are set up in 1792. Very rapidly, things begin to expand, just to give you a sense of numbers here by 1800. So we're talking about 11 years into the Constitution going into effect. The postal system was transmitting 1.9 million newspapers per year. Think about that. Um, by 1840, 39 million newspapers per year are, are being spread through the mail. So it becomes, it already is significant, although not necessarily distinctively American, it becomes more distinctively American as it becomes more widespread and, and further reaching, and it becomes more and more bound in with the spread of information. And that's one of the larger points that I want to make here, is that the postal system, in addition to just spreading mail, um, was assumed to, or even without assumptions, did accomplish a lot of things. So for one thing, in a sense, most 
fundamentally, the postal system moves information, moving information spreads ideas. So the, the intellectual grounding of the country is built up and sustained through the mail. I think equally important, and right now I'm gonna come back to this at the end, a postal system creates, in a sense, a sense of an us, right? A postal system, um, an observer in 1829 said the postal system creates, quote, a chain of sympathies. Um, another person said, what a chain of trust and confidence in one another, how vast and systematic an arrangement, how gigantic must not an institution be to bring about such an effect. Think about the connections that are required political connections, networking connections, human connections to sustain, to create and sustain the postal system. So the fact that we can put something in the mail and assume it's going to get to where it's going, the fact that we can be where we are and assume we are going to get information from far reaches and that we need that information and can get it. The postal system is one of many ways in which the national government helps to create a sense of a national us. Again, something we don't think about. I've written about that in terms of Congress in my most recent book, right? Congress, in a sense, creates a sense of an us. And when Congress isn't functioning well, we lose that sense of a place to go where an us can be represented. It's something we really take for granted. I think we're taking it for granted less now because a lot of what we're debating right now is who's included in that us. The postal system is part of that argument. Who is the us and, and what, do we, what are our rights? What do we receive? How do we communicate with each other? How do we connect with each other? I'm gonna come back to that at the end of my comments here. Um, the postal system is a tool of empowerment, right? By, by spreading information, by connecting people. In this very same way that we're watching people figure out how social media is useful and also a little scary in the realm of empowerment, but still, um, you can see we're watching that happen with social media. The same thing is true of the mail, that the postal system can be a tool of empowerment as well. So access to information, empowerment, creating in us, and accountability, right? The fact that all of those things are happening, the postal system is a way of holding the government accountable. And right now we're talking about that in the realm of voting, uh, and ballots, but on an even broader scale. The postal system is a way of people knowing what's going on in the national capital and Americans giving their opinion on what's going on. And particularly in this early period, that was primarily the way to do it. You know, it's interesting when um, the government first moved to Washington, D.C., one of the things that people worried about was, you know, when it was when the national government was, the, the capital was New York and then was Philadelphia, those were cities that already existed, were already tied in to a national network. Washington was, in a, in a sense, a, a city being built as people were already living in it. It was not as tied in and the government sort of planted itself there, you know, of a sudden. Um, and there was a lot of concern. I can't remember now who said this quote, but there's a quote from the time from someone who says that, the government in, is going to be in Washington. The national government is going to be sitting there by itself in Washington. Who's going to be watching? Like, how, how will we know what they're doing? It could easily be the most corrupt government on the face of the earth if there aren't ways to hold it accountable. And the postal system was seen, and newspapers and the press were seen as vital ways to keep that going, to enforce accountability, to spread the kind of information that's necessary to keep the public informed and the public, public opinion is the ultimate um, power source in any kind of democratic form of government. And it's really striking when you look back, like there's a, there's a quote, um, I think Fisher Ames of Massachusetts um, says it in the 1790s, um, for a time, you know, even when the national government was based in New York and in Philadelphia, um, when the national government was there and meeting, when Congress was meeting, when there was a national government, um, people could write to their members of Congress or write to people in Washington from wherever they were in the nation and get news about what was happening. When Congress 
adjourned, you know, when basically when they went away for, you know, a recess, to many Americans, and in a way this was true, the government just dissolved. And there was no way to find out what was happening on a national level. So Fisher Ames, who's this very, um, he's very conservative, but also a wonderful, dour, dry, witty kind of a writer, and also someone who's very emotional about politics. There's a quote from him writing to someone when government is in recess, Congress is in recess, and he's writing to a friend and he's like, I don't know what's going on anywhere. Like, I just don't know what's happening in the nation. And the, the metaphor he uses is he says, I'm sitting in the dark. I'm sitting in the dark. I can't see. I don't know how to see what's going on. And I love that. It's why I remember it so well. It's so vivid. It gives such a sense of what it feels like to be cut off from information and in this early period when there weren't other ways to overcome that lack of information, there you were, again, really showing you the power um, of the postal system. Someone just said, is this today's meeting? Yes, it's the 820. You are here, Melissa. <laughs> You're in the right place. We're talking about the postal system. Uh, well, we will be better at, at maintaining the website. I guess there was some confusion there, but you, thank you, Melissa. You were in the right place. Couldn't, totally couldn't... me dropping the ball, folks. <laughs> But but yes, stay with us. You were in the right place. Um, okay, so uh, my larger point here is the, the how crucial the post office was in these early years, but how it remains so. You know, so advance a little bit in time. Think about the 19th century. People really had um, a, a real investment in the power, the right of petitioning the government. That was seen as the fundamental way that you could demand things of your government, particularly of your members of Congress. The government is smaller. People, a lot of people knew personally their members of Congress in some way or another, or assumed they could write a letter to them and would get a response on a personal level. Petitioning you know, when, when you get into the realm of abolitionism, anti-slavery, um, a lot of the reform movements going on in the early-ish 19th century, petitions are a driving, driving force. And of course, the mail is the fundamental way in which those petitions are being circulated and sent to Washington. So again, the mail at the absolute base of the mechanics of a working democracy. That said, and if, again, going right back to abolitionism, abolitionist and anti-slavery petitions, um, link that in with um, anti-slavery and abolitionist movements who began trying to circulate anti-slavery pamphlets throughout the South in the 1830s. Um, the postal system has not necessarily been partisan to the degree it is right now, but it's always political. And there's a difference, right? because it is so, such a fundamental part of democracy, because it has such power, there is a power in having some reach into it, right? So for example, postmaster um, Jackson, you know, the person who was under, under Andrew Jackson, the postmaster is in a sense a political position because it's a position that has power. It's not necessarily saying that it's absolutely partisan in the sense that we're looking at right now, but there's a politicization of the postal system um, and the attempt in the South to stop the postal circulation of anti-slavery pamphlets is a great example of that, as is um, how eager people were to get into that position of being postmaster to really, if they couldn't control, they could at least have touch on the wide reaching impact of the postal system and potentially have some kind of an impact. So it's not as though the postal system has always been this happy little neutral thing existing and now all of a sudden it's political. Because it's so fundamental to democracy, it has political importance that's long been recognized. What we're looking at now is a, a different order of things, which is the, the partisan, what do I wanna say? Um, maneuvering of the Postal Service for explicitly partisan purpose uh, in the open air, right? And that's um, some of what we're experiencing today, some of what's distinctive about it. It's not just what's going on, but the fact that it's so blatant, um, so in the open air, um, so unapologetically done as though there's a perfect sense of entitlement to do it. Um, that's part of the reason why we're noticing it, you know, and some things that should have been noticed before, long before, 
are getting more attention now because they're so blatant. But that's some of what we're seeing now is not, it's because it's, because we can see photographs of blue mailboxes being carted off and um, mail sorting machines being thrown into parking lots, right? Where you can't avoid the sight of it. And because of that, we're seeing something, um, grappling with something, being forced to reckon with something in a way that as bad as this moment is, it's important because it's one of many ways in which we're, we're being forced to reckon with what holds us together, what really allows a democracy to work, and what are we going to do about it? Now, I, that that sort of relates. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, make one more point about uh, the historic post office, and then swing back to now, and then open things up for question. Um, the larger other point I want to make historically about the post office is the degree to which it really does inform the nation about the rest of the nation. And really interesting to me, an extreme example of that, and it's counterintuitive. Uh, and I talk about it in uh, my most recent book, The Field of Blood. In the years before the Civil War, in particularly the late 1840s and 1850s, but particularly actually the 1850s, part of what the Postal Service was doing was enabling North and South to see and hear uh, and read what, actually and West, what other sections of the Union were saying about them. So suddenly Southerners had a, a much quicker and deeper understanding of what Northerners were saying about the South and vice versa. And at a moment when um, sectionalism was rising and distrust, particularly North and South was rising, the mail by nationalizing sentiment, by spreading communication, actually in a sense did harm, right? It was so effective at doing what it did that informing people about what was going on in a sense, like now, really, made people aware of something that they hadn't necessarily been aware of before and forced people to reckon with it, right? So um, it's important to note that, I think, because um, very few things are unapologetically uh, good or bad. Some things are. Um, but even things that are absolutely a good um, need to be seriously thought about not overruled, not controlled, not eliminated, but thought about um, because what brings power um, can bring good and can bring bad and we need to reckon with that too. Okay, now I want to swing back to today before I open things up for questions. Um, as I started out by saying the postal system is so easy or has been until now to take for granted. Um, I, I want to be um, clear here and I think it's the point that I've been made that I've been making so far, what we're looking at now isn't just um, an attempt to prevent people from voting, although it very much is that, right? What we're looking at is an attempt to shape an election for partisan purposes. So it's not as though that's not there. It is um, on a logistical level too, right? It's interfering with the delivery of mail. It's interfering with our ability to uh, circulate goods and keep ourselves supplied in one way or another. There's a lot of pragmatic and political ways in which the current moment is, is chipping away at some fundamental bonds. But I think it's important to note along the lines of what I just said, that attacking the post office is one way of many that you can weaken the links between us, between the national us, and I think there are so many ways right now in which that is being done, in which that is, is sometimes deliberate, right? That there isn't a big us, that there's a one us and then a lot of thems. Um, and there's a lot of rhetoric, uh, much of it coming from those in power, that, the, that we should remain in power and they should have none. Um, you know, you could reverse it and say, you know, there are people out of power who might say the same thing in reverse. I think most people aren't saying that. I think most people are thinking in the way that a government should function. There's a bigger us, there's a more inclusive us that needs to be present for this government to function as a democracy. And by chipping away at the post office, that's one of many ways in which you, you sort of chip away at the us, you chip away at something that keeps us connected with each other. And what's important to remember, and we're seeing it absolutely in the way that this post office um, what I want to call it, controversy is playing out. So this was happening, right? And we were watching things begin to happen and we were seeing things with 
postal boxes and we were beginning to notice things. But what happened was people began to respond on social media, uh, in, the me in other forms of media, right? There was a big public response to what was going on. And it's that public response that partly pushed the larger reaction that we're seeing, right? The house was out of session. There was enough of a fuss that now they're back. And so that's a point I wanna make, right? I, I, I'm talking again and again and again about how attacking the postal system attacks one of the things that creates an us. Part of the reason why people tend to do that when they want power is because it's the us that has the power, right? In a democracy, it's the us that gives power. And what we're looking at now is one way, and there's been a number of ways in which we've seen this, and I think it's easy to overlook these two. It's a way in which there still is an us, and if we put up a fuss, a fussing us, if we say something, if we act, if we come together to express what we think, it can have an impact. And I. I feel that that's so important to say because I think it's so tempting at moments when it seems that things are happening on a grand scale um, in Washington and that we have no power. That's not true. Um, I wrote a piece in the Atlantic, uh, it came out on Monday, um, about as a historian why um, I have um, some hope for the present and a lot of fear for the present, but then I have hope. And a lot of that hope is grounded in the fact that we, the we, a big we, we can act. Things have not been determined. Fates are not decided. It may feel that way, but that's not the case. And it's important to remember that. It's important to realize that, and I've said this from the first week we've been doing History Matters, things are contingent. They're not decided right now. And so what we do matters. And I think watching the playing out of the dynamics of this postal system controversy is a great example of that and a reminder that we need to keep paying attention. And more than that, we need to keep stepping up and making a fuss because we still matter. And if we remain quiet, we won't. So I guess that's one thing that I, I a point that I want to make about the postal system. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the testimony that's going to happen tomorrow in the House regarding uh, the Postmaster General. But I wanted to talk about this today because I want as many people as possible to go into that armed with what the post office, what the postal system really does, what its power is, what its significance is, and what harming it or weakening it uh, or crippling it can do. Because I assume that's what's going to happen tomorrow is a lot of um, talk about cutting costs and I don't know what else. And I'm sure, you know, there'll be, there'll be financial talk as ways to justify things. It's hard to imagine that won't be the case. But given everything that I just said, given all of the ways in which the Postal Service is so fundamental to the working of a democracy, you can't talk about that without considering all of the things that I've just thrown out on the table here. And I want people to keep that in mind, regardless of what's said tomorrow, because that's the fundamental issue that's de at debate right now. What I've talked about this morning is what's being under debate with the postal system, as it is in so many other ways. Okay, um, I'm getting myself all worked up here. Um, two things before I open things up. Um, number one is, and I meant to do this at the beginning, um, one of the things that I went into this morning to prepare for this uh, is this book by Richard John called Spreading the News, with my little post-it note in it. Um, it's pretty much the place to go if you want to understand um, what the postal system was assumed to be doing in these early years, what it did, what people thought about it, how it spread, the politics of it. So I highly recommend this if you're looking for this kind of background information, Spreading the News um, by Richard John. The other thing I have to do, and I didn't forget it because of my um, tragic flaw. For anyone here who happens to be new, um, every week I try to come up with a coffee mug that relates to the topic of that's going on. I've managed to do that for like 18 weeks and I'm running short on mugs. Today is a great example of that. So I kind of made my own something um, to represent the post office. Um, I don't know, I hope some of you will remember this image. I do. Um, but the problem 
is that it has forced me to be sipping on paper as I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> so um, does anyone remember Mr. Zip? Oh, yeah. When, the, when zip codes were first really coming into use uh, in the, I think the 1960s, Mr. Zip was like the way, like this little cartoon character that, you know, remember the zip code. That's what I thought of this morning when I was like, what can I make an image of and stick on my coffee cup to represent this conversation? <laughs> Mr. Zip seemed the way to go, which was a fine idea, but I have now learned more in case I need to do this again, which is make it smaller so that it doesn't get all weird when you try to tape it on your cup. And don't put it near the top because then you're sipping paper, <laughs> which is what I've been doing all during this conversation. So and, at any rate. And by the way, while, while we're on the subject, uh, Donna was trying to get you a post office mug, but ironically, the slow post office <laughs> is what prevented that from be reaching you before today's episode. Uh, Donna, Melissa, you ask, you can always send mugs to uh, NCHE. Uh, main office in University Heights, Ohio, and we will get it to Joanne. That way we're, we won't be publishing Joanne's, you know, home address on the internet at any time. Yeah, that's the problem. I will find a way to get back to the post office mug. It's not as though there's not a lot else that we can say. That is true. <laughs> so I'm sure I will find another way so that Donna, do not despair. Your The mug will have its moment in the spotlight. Um, but at any rate, okay, I'm gonna stop. Uh, and open things up and we can have a discussion. And oh, we have lots of questions today. Seven questions so far. Let's see here. Um, and then, uh, all right, let's see. Which is, uh, so an anonymous, so I, I cannot give credit where credit is due here. Someone's asking which has more impact today on making my opinion known to a member of Congress? Mailing them a letter or tweeting them? Good question. Um, well, as I understand it, and this, this is not um, knowledge that I possess, but it's based on um, what I've been reading, input from congressional staffers about this very sort of thing. Um, letters have an impact. I mean, I've written, I guess it's been a while since I've written a letter, and this is part of why. Letters have an impact. I actually think phone calls have a big impact mm -hmm. um, because as I understand it from congressional staffers, they keep logs of the calls that come in. Now I do realize also, and I've seen this because um, I'll go on Twitter and I'll say, you know, let's call in and people will respond by saying, yeah, they're not answering mm -hmm. or, you know, they're saying their box is full or whatever that in and of itself, that's just charming, right? I want to contact my member of Congress. Oh, sorry, you can't. However, I do think that phone calls are an order um, more of more power than letters. Um, I think tweeting can have an impact. I think we're seeing every day the ways that Twitter has an impact, that social media has an impact. But the problem is I think that's less predictable. Um, so I would encourage people to just, you know, plaster, uh, respond in any way you can. My, I still have a gut sense that phone calls um, just because people haven't figured out necessarily yet the, the real um, best way to corral social media, uh, that mm -hmm. phone calls still kind of remain the ultimate power, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do other things. I guess I might put a Twitter as a second runner up because if you get enough people to retweet something that will seem notable slash threatening in some way that it might get a response. Um, but that's, again, that's that's from what I've read uh, congressional staffers say, and that does not come from direct knowledge. Yeah, I, and I have no direct knowledge either. I would just add, um, I've heard that um, a fair amount of weight is put on letters when they actually get there, um, only because it, the assumption now is that it takes a fair amount of effort to write a letter and stamp it, and so therefore it carries a little more weight. But um, Elaine am, says also emails get tracked, so that's yeah. true. I yeah, didn't... absolutely. Yeah. Um, history question, and this is from Tom McAndrew. Uh, didn't the origin, and I don't know if you know this or not, so feel free to say I have no idea, because um, we did not talk about this beforehand. Uh, didn't the origins of the Postal Service predate the Constitution and even the Declaration? I thought it was set up as an alternative to the postal system previously established by the British in part to protect communication between patriot organizations and the governments. Okay, so um, I can give you a, a 
condensed version of that. Okay. The royal postal system is sort of what was in operation. Part of what happened in the revolutionary period, um, and I guess I, I don't know if I would brand it postal system, um, but if you think about things like um, committees of correspondence, I have a wonderful grad student working on this. If you think about all of the ways in which committees of various sorts were setting up ways to communicate reliably uh, between each other to create an us, there were ways of communication increasingly systematized means of communication being set up among revolutionaries because they needed to be outside of the Royal Postal Service. You know, I when I use terms um, like system, you know, like party system, I have a very hard time using that before um, Andrew Jackson because I just don't think it was a system and they didn't really think about them as parties. This is another example of that in which absolutely people were finding alternative ways to communicate partly because they needed to be able to communicate with each other apart and separate and and privately from you know anything that was royally controlled and also because there was a need along the lines of what i just said to spread information to create a bigger us to yoke people in and for all of those reasons communication not surprisingly was a fundamental part of a successful revolutionary effort and so this was part of that um tom uh the other tom um this is this is a great question i honestly don't know the answer to it or even how to approach it so i think it's a great question so i'm going to put it out there and then just maybe a wow that's a great question let's move on type of thing so just keep that in mind um I seem to recall that there was censorship through the mail as recently as a few decades ago. Uh, books that were judged obscene, such as Allen Ginsberg's Howl, were blocked, were they not? City Lights books was raided because they published and were selling the book. How did this come to an end? Okay, so I don't know the details of that. I would say there are two separate issues there. Yeah. Um, so one of them has to do with the circulation of things that are deemed dangerous. The other has to do with um, book burning or dangerous books or books being considered out of bounds. The latter, you know, we see that, we still see discussions about that. As far as circulating in the mail in the 20th century and how that's been controlled, I actually don't, <laughs> I don't know that. That's the scary 20th century. Um, it, it is getting, touching on the very issue that I'm talking about here, which is, it's one of many ways in which it would be very possible to close off ideas, to stop communication, to silence, right? We've talked about that before too. All of the ways in which um, words have power and in which in one way or another, uh, people try to silence words, right? We talked about the gag rule. Um, we've just talked about um, abolitionist pamphlets being kept from the mails. Um, I talked about Congress in the 1850s and congressmen standing up and saying to each other, watch your words, watch your words, calling words missiles, right? Words have power and we haven't really talked about um, books uh, necessarily, but they fit into the same realm. And so it's hardly surprising and in a sense to be expected that in one way or another, they will be a target of people who are trying to silence something that feels like a threat. Um, Carolyn wants to know, can you comment on the role of patronage in the post office in the early years of the Republic? Yeah, th that's particularly true. That becomes particularly true when, when you get real parties, you know, so like under Jackson with his, you know, what would have been called, what we now call long coattails, you know, that Jackson becomes president and then there are all of these patronage positions that get staffed and the assumption is that that's what's supposed to happen. Um, before that point, you know, if you, if you look, for example, at um, what happens when Thomas Jefferson becomes president, uh, the election of 1800 and 1801, until that point, the government had been federalist. And so, you know, at, at a certain point, uh, uh, most of the positions, if not all of them, customs collectors and everything else, they're federalists. And Jefferson takes office and suddenly he's faced with an, a government that's entirely staffed by people who don't really agree with his politics. Mm -hmm. um, and he has to figure out what to do. And he does it very self-consciously. You know, he says, I, I, I'm gonna need to take some people out of their office so that I can put some people in office that are not federalists. And this is contentious, right? And there's discussion of it. And um, he, you know, 
talks about this publicly and there's a public debate about it, should it be happening and there's outrage. So there is not an assumption about patronage and coattails in that way, in the way that happens later in that early period, it's still being worked out within two decades, <laughs> it's really there. Um, sometimes, and this isn't necessarily true about Postmaster, um, but some of these, um, you know, patronage positions are, are things that you can do and collect money in and have very little responsibility in, and right, the coattails are a way of literally riding your way to money uh, and, and influence. And so some of those positions, that's really what they're seen as. Um, but the postmaster, you know, ultimately is a position that has importance. I think you can really see that under Jackson. I haven't written about that extensively in any way. Um, but that's it. That would be an easy thing um, to look up and, and look at and see, you know, anything that's going to talk about the Jackson presidency is going to talk about the Postal Service um, and how that really becomes, you know, in a sense, part of Jackson's kitchen cabinet, part of the the inner workings of the government um, in a way that it might not have been before. Uh, Gloria asks a, a good question and I'm going to actually broaden it. Um, so I'm ask her a question and then uh, I'll give you, I'm going to kind of broaden it just a little bit, which she asks, uh, did Franklin use the postal system to support the Federalist argument over the Anti-Federalists? And so maybe a broader way to think about this is in, in what way was the postal system involved in the Federalist Anti-Federalist arguments? That's interesting. I mean, you know, if you think about it, uh, a lot of what we see um, regarding that the debate over the Constitution is newspaper essays, right? The Federalist, their newspaper essays, um, which goes back to where I started today, but that newspapers are seen as um, a way in which not only does it circulate in a newspaper, but it Newspapers circulate so widely that in a tavern or in a coffee house, someone could stand up and read from a newspaper um, and that information will spread even more. And you see people emailing newspapers to each other. You know, I've tried at various points in the past to, to track one copy of a newspaper and see who sends it to who, who sends it to who, who sends it to. So um, certainly the newspapers were assumed to be a tool for that. And that's part of why they're so debated when the government starts off. But um, you know, letters, um, I, I can't speak absolutely for Franklin. What I can say is that letters were assumed to be vehicles of politics. Um, and a great example of this is um, the circular letter, uh, which is fascinating to me. So um, congressmen particularly would do this. Uh, if they had news to report, they, they couldn't necessarily you know, communicate in any way with all of their constituents. They weren't necessarily going to go into the newspaper and say, let me tell you about what I've done. So what they would do is they would write a circular letter to be circulated, right? That, that something that could be sent around so that people could get a sense of what was happening. Um, and they they were confronting this in a really literal kind of a way. There's a, there's a letter I found a zillion years ago um, by a member of Congress trying to figure out how to let his constituents know what was going on. And he initially says, um, uh, which is just a reminder of what we're talking about when we're talking about 1790, 1800, 1810. He says, um, came up with this idea. I'm going to write a letter to my wife containing all the news that people need to know. And people will know that my wife has the letter and they'll come to our house to read it and she'll get visitors. <laughs> Which in his mind is like an excellent idea, you know? I but, love but, that. Right, you can, you can see, it's one of the things that fascinates me about this early period. The ground level grappling with how to spread information and make politics work. There's a similar example with um, political pamphlets uh, and Thomas Jefferson in the late 1790s, right? Jefferson uh, at, at one point, it wants, I wanna make sure I'm getting the time period right. Yeah, he, so he wants, there's a pamphlet he reads um, that he wants to spread, but he doesn't know how to spread it. And he says something along the lines of, you know, there are these clubs um, that meet, you know, like these, uh, maybe like either Democratic, Republican societies or other clubs of people that meet and they mail things to each other. So maybe we could use them to circulate the pamphlet 
wouldn't that be great, right? Struggling to, to spread information in such a basic ground level way that again, a reminder mm -hmm. of the power of something that can do that in an automatic and, and trusted way. And that's an, a topic I didn't mention. I had it written down on my piece of paper and forgot to mention it, is that the postal system relies largely on trust, right? Trust of the institution, trust of the, the system, trust that you drop something in the mail and it's going to get to where it's going. So there, there is also a, a sort of sentiment or, or sort of fundamental underpinning of the postal system, which is also worth thinking about because what we're seeing now is a lot of trust in government uh, and in each other being broken down. Um, so that's also something that's, that's at play. Um, so folks, if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in. Some of these, uh, there's some great questions, but they're sort of more a little topical um, to today's uh, events. So um, some of them I can't put into what we're talking about today. While you're looking for questions, I'm going to mention something that I see. Okay. Um, people, so people are asking about last week's conversation. Uh, their internet was down. They couldn't see it. Um, was it recorded? It's not up on the website yet. So, um, so part of what I want to communicate to people is um, occasionally we're slow, but the fact of the matter is that these are always recorded, always, mm -hmm. and then posted on the same website page as the link to get into these sessions. Um, Correct. So, you know, I guess this is the 20th one? 20th. Gosh. So, so there's going to be 20 of these, you know, within a day or yeah. so, we'll post this one. Um, so if there has been a, a, a sort of lapse, um, our apologies for that. But the fact of the matter is, these are recorded explicitly and archived because we don't assume that everybody can come here at this time. And actually, that, that raises another point that I meant to say at the beginning. Um, we're coming into the season when school is beginning again. I know a lot of people who follow this are teachers. Um, many are not, but I do realize that with summer ending, schedules are going to be changing. I also realize that that means that um, there will be fewer people who can come. Like our, our us might get a little smaller, which I kind of hate. Uh, but uh, we will hopefully, um, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, still be doing this, still be archiving things uh, so that you can still be part of the us, even if you're not there live. I'm going to. Um, really, really um, do my best to keep this going. I have not tried to do this and teach at the same time. Um, I teach, I'm going to be teaching on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and this is Thursday morning. Ideally speaking, I shall be able to do this, so we will try. I, I just think it's important um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I mentioned now that hopefully it's going to keep going, uh, and those archive postings on the same page where you connect the link, nche.net backslash conversations, that will be where you'll be able to, to, to find the community mm -hmm. um, recorded. Okay, I will stop and open things up to, to questions. Uh, I just, I want to piggyback that with a couple things. First of all, it's totally on me that I dropped a ball on the link today. So I apologize. Joanne had nothing to do with it. Feel free to put all your ire and hatred and uh, put that on me because it's totally my fault and I apologize for that. Um, and then, uh, so one other place that you can always go is we do we do almost always um, stream this live on Facebook, which saves the video. So if you miss the episode and you're waiting for us to upload it and put it on our website, you can always go to Facebook and watch the video live, uh, the replay of the video. So go to our Facebook page, which is NC four H E the number the number four um, H E is our um, our Facebook handle or whatever. So, um, and we will absolutely try to do these better. The other thing I want to mention is, and we tried this early on, and uh, I think um, with school coming up, and Joanne, I'm totally throwing this on you, like uh -oh. out talking to you first. So, my apologies, but we did try this early on with uh, folks who might want to ask questions ahead of time. That we'll try to figure out a way to. Um, so, if you can't be at the episode, then we will at least figure out a way for you to fill out a form or something so that we can ask your question live, even though you're, um, you know, going to be watching it later on. So that's it. No, I, I'm thumbs up. I think oh. that's a great idea. So that, so that if fewer people can, can be there while we're live, you can still ask questions and then look um, ideally for the answer. We can't promise we will answer every question that's sent, but at least it, it opens that, that door 
for that kind of exchange. Absolutely. Um, so getting back to, we have a four minutes so we can ask one, maybe one or two more questions. Um, uh, the first, uh, somebody asked, what is the book you mentioned that was right before the mug? Spreading the news. Uh, the subtitle is The American Postal System from Franklin to Morse by Richard John. Is a fine book. I'm getting better at remembering to put the book here. So <laughs> it's been the last couple of weeks, but I've done better job. So yeah. Uh, where did that last question go that I wanted to ask? Um... While you're looking for it, I am going to mention one thing because I saw somebody okay. mention it in chat. Um, and I, I forgot to mention it. And most of you probably already know about this. Some of you might not. Um, but a couple of weeks back, I was walking around outside eating an ice cream cone and a total stranger um, walked past me. And as they passed, they said out loud, yay, history, <laughs> which still blows my mind. But clearly they knew who I was somehow. Uh, and they said, yay, history. And that that has become one of our mottos, you know, hashtag yay history. I mentioned it because for those of you who were not aware of it, it is important. Uh, so I'm, I'm spreading it around. We have, to, we have to make better use of it, Matt. We have to find what to do with that because um, yes. that was that, that moment, like that made my summer <laughs> all by itself. Like, yay, if that is my impact, if my impact in part is yay history, that's a fine, fine that's, thing. That, that is a fine way to, to find impact on the world, absolutely. It, it yes, one now. What of our two? We we have two hashtags now for for the show. We have yay history and history I mugs. This Larry has yayhistory.com registered. Ooh. We and, and if we want it, that's important. Larry, you have done a wise thing. We yes. will have to communicate about what what that means. Yes. Um. So. We, we're running up on it. We're running about 11 because we're just chatting at this point. But um, so if, and I cannot find the question that I was looking for here. Um, but this, I, the idea was that I can't find it. It's just one of those days, folks. I apologize. Uh, I see. I'm, I'm quickly, if the Postal Service is a part of the National Us, this group is a citizens us. It is. Yeah, we can yeah. empower more citizens. Um, you know, I really, um, every day I'm trying to figure out what I could do to have some influence, right? I wrote that, I read here la a week or two ago, right? The, the piece that I just published in the Atlantic as I was writing it. I published that piece because I, I, it's one of many ways that I'm like, please. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Please, people pay attention to what is happening. Um, and so this Citizens Us uh, is one way, and uh, I'd love the group of us to get together here and talk. I also count on the fact that you go from here um, and do your part too. Uh, so however, whatever impact that has, it, it matters. Uh, that's, that's what we can do. Um, do you, oh, totally unrelated, but I'll answer it. Um, do we need to request special permission to use excerpts from my Yale American Revolution course? Okay, I will mention my, uh, the course I teach at Yale, the American Revolution, a, a normal lecture course. They're beginning to do construction on my building and I was waiting to see if we would outlast it. Um, my American Revolution course, they just stuck a camera in the back of the room and filmed it and it's online. If you search American Revolution, uh, Joanne Freeman, I think it's History 116, you'll get it. Um, and it's free, you can just watch it. As I understand it, you can use it. Um, I don't know if people have ever sought permission or have to seek permission. I know a lot of people use bits of it in their classes. Um, I'll see if I, I'll find out if that's necessary. As I understand it, it's just kind of out there, <laughs> floating around. Um, but I'll, I'll double check uh, and find a way to communicate that. But I, I think it's just, it's just there. Uh, and you can always use episodes like th this. This show is free to the public as well. So feel free to use episodes or bits of episodes um, in your classrooms of this show as well. There are a lot of great doc documents we've covered in the last 20 weeks yeah. or so. Yeah, there are some amazing documents. Can't believe it's been 20 weeks, but that's, that, you know. Can't so. 20 weeks either. I woke but, up kind of stunned by that, but, but yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I just about to say? Oh, and, and so the one thing I thought I was going to talk about today and didn't, but I'll mention it. 
um, is was going to be a riff off of that Atlantic beat. So for those of you um, who want a little historical insight into this moment and how to think about it, I might end up doing this next week. But um, it's it's the title is something like I'm a historian and I have fear and hope for the present or something like that. Um, find it and read it. And if I do talk about this next week, it'll be one of the things I post. But at any rate, okay. Um, We're at 11 o'clock, so why don't we wrap up and then uh, yeah. we'll proceed to any after parties, should it organically occur. Uh, in the meantime, everybody, thank you for coming. I will see you next week. Uh, stay safe, yay history, um, and see you soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>